Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Hi guys, how are you? Hi. Hi. I am so excited to start this conversation. We've already talked offline a little. I always think I should just hit record in the beginning because we get good stuff, but I'm so excited to welcome you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having us. So I can't wait to talk about the work that you've done and the amazing journey that you've been on. But first of all, why don't we start off by just letting you all introduce yourselves to my audience so that we can learn a little bit more about you. Sure. You want to go first? I am Hilda Bernier. I am one of the subjects in Forget Me Not documentary. I am... Emilio Smother, he's also one of the subjects which the documentary goes around. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm so happy to have you. Olivier? Yep. My name's Olivier Bernier and I'm Hilda's husband. And we made a film together called Forget Me Not, which is a feature documentary now available. And the film follows the journey of trying to have our son Emilio included, who at the time the film ends, he's four years old. And Emilio was born with Down syndrome. And we faced some challenges, to say the least, in the New York City public school system trying to get him included. So I think that there are a million things that are really important in what you just said, but I just want to take a second to pause on something that is just preposterous. We had a family that had a situation that was extreme, that a documentary was made, and it's about inclusion of a four-year-old. Four years old. When you stop to think about that and you think about the intent of the federal law, it's just preposterous. That's a rhetorical comment (laughs) that we're going to circle back to, but that's just, it's crazy. Yeah, we really didn't expect it. I guess the journey of making the film started really the day he was born when we learned that he had Down syndrome never really spent time with anyone who had Down syndrome. And I started to reflect on that, why I was so unprepared for Emilio's arrival. And I realized that I had never encountered anyone with Down syndrome throughout my life. And I started to think, why? I went to high school with 3,000 people. How did I not meet anyone with Down syndrome, autism, any significant disability? And I started to realize that they've been hidden from me my entire life. And I started to have a lot of feelings about that. And I wanted to make sure that Emilio was never hidden from anybody. So it became our goal to make sure that he was included in everything we did and included in life in general. And at two and a half, when it became time to get him ready for preschool, that's when we started encountering some resistance. And isn't it so crazy? Because my growing up was similar to yours, not exactly parallel, but very similar. I knew people with Down syndrome, but not many. I teased in the hospital that I knew one little boy fairly well, and therefore I knew the sign no. And boy, did that ever become helpful with my son, Jack. (laughs) How to say no. But it's so interesting how you came from this background where you didn't really interact with very many people that had disabilities at all. And immediately the shift happened where you said, I want to change that in this future world. Hilda, was your background the same? And also I'm curious about where you guys grew up because I don't think that this is regional. In fact, I think probably where you grew up makes it even more indicative of the problem. So yeah, I grew up in Puerto Rico and over there also the segregation of students with disabilities, it's, it's, it's prevalent. I, when I moved to the States, I had the opportunity of becoming a special education teacher and a bilingual education teacher as well. 
And I started working with these populations of students with very particular needs in, in, in Brooklyn schools. And I did learn a lot from that experience, from that experience. One of the major, the major things I learned was that children need to be together. And through my work experience, I noticed how segregation was very detrimental to their development. And I, when I had Emilio, I quickly noticed that I was going to now become part of that army of parents that are trying to achieve inclusion for their children. And I think part, part of my work experience informed that choice. However, when I had to start making choices and plans with Olivier when Emilio was just turning three. It was, I always wanted to trust the specialist, how yeah. some people, they don't see, they don't see education the way we see it. So it quickly became apparent that we needed to educate ourselves and find resources to make sure that Emilio was fully included. Yeah, I agree. So can we talk about Emilio's life from birth to preschool aged? I, when we talked offline, you guys said we wanted him to be included in education in community, certainly in our home life. And so from like an inclusion standpoint, what did you all do from birth to three? How did you behave? How did that inclusive mindset really look before this big school fiasco started to happen? We took him along with us everywhere. At the time, we were in Brooklyn. And whether it was going to a brewery on a Sunday or doing different activities, it would take him swimming and just being with all our other friends that had children at the same time. We just really didn't see that much of a difference besides all the early intervention that he was receiving and all the therapies. In many ways to us, he, Emilio was our first child. We had nothing to compare him to really. And we just gave him all the love in the world and did as many things as we could with him. But to us, like we really didn't notice, we knew he had Down syndrome, but we didn't notice a difference with him immediately. It wasn't until the later years when people start telling you that it's going to be a challenge to go to school and maybe you should think about these settings and it's like society imposed barriers. Yeah. yeah, so true. And what's crazy is, I also said this before, see, we should have hit record before. <laughs> now I have a 12 year old who we did the same thing. Breweries on Sundays and all the flights and all the trips and in and out of the stroller and the zoo pass and the ballet lessons and all of it. Um, and now he's 12 and baseball isn't safe. You can't play baseball with your typical peers because you're going to get hit by a frozen rope in the first hit. And basketball, you're going to get trampled. And so life does start to bypass you because of safety and because of other things. And my point in saying this is I look back in retrospect because we had a similar experience to you all where our kindergarten transition was a rocky road inclusion wise, and we really had to advocate and, and we succeeded in doing so. But I look back and think, oh my gosh, how crazy that now I see that the differences are really glaring and they are reasonably affecting his ability to participate in many things with his typical peers in the same way that they do. Not that he can't participate, but he's going to participate differently. And Good God, it was so easy when he was four and five and two and a half. Like he actually was doing what other people were doing. And it looked a lot like that. So I'm curious then what happened. Tell everybody what happened. Like, how did you know that the discussion with school was not going to go as easily as it could have gone? Yeah, to your point, the world is not built for people with disabilities. It's certainly not. And I think that's where the trouble is that where are the team sports for people that don't necessarily want to get hit by a pitch or it's you start to get a different viewpoint of the world with Emilio and his education, it really started with the evaluations. People would come over for an hour and judge him and see what he couldn't do. And, or we'd go to an office and they'd put a bunch of things in front of him and he would get a little nervous and he wouldn't do things that he could do at home very normally, like pick out colors and shapes and all that stuff. Emilio academically was more advanced 
I think at that age than many kids because he received so much education at home. Yeah. I call that over therapizing. <laughs> right. A lot of times, particularly kids with Down syndrome and other developmental disorders, their adaptive skills will be actually enhanced on tests, especially when they're younger, because basically we almost teach the skills that come in sequence on those standardized tests. So sometimes that actually helps us if we've got a district that wants to pocket somebody into a class because of IQ score or because of adaptive skills. I'm like, well, the adaptive skills are really good. They're actually over therapized. <laughs> so yeah, that's a very good point. And it happens often. I have to say, I think you're lucky that your evaluations lasted an hour because around here, sometimes they're like 15 minutes and you're like, he stacked four blocks. What what could you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, I understand that all these specialists, they need to justify providing, providing the services or recommending services. However, focus is so much the deficiencies of the child and not in the things that they act, that, that that the child can actually do, that it just becomes very depressing for the parents to begin because you think that you're, you know, that you're doing your best to to keep up, <laughs> basically. And then once you get these reports, they just cast such a shadow over your child that is it's it's very sad and it's enraging. I personally was very angry because I couldn't if like they were correct or I was idealizing things or I should have given them the benefit of the doubt. (laughs) Yeah, I think that raises a good point that the self-doubt that comes from parents is significant. And Hilda, like you, I wasn't a special ed teacher, but I was a German teacher and my mom taught. I had certainly sat through plenty of IEP meetings and had participated in IEP meetings, and I still felt, maybe I'm wrong. Can he actually not do this? And it was that self-doubt comes in, and then you get even more, it's maddening, because you get even more frustrated with the entire process. I don't know. I don't have a master's in special education, or I'm not an occupational therapist, whatever it is. I think that's a very good point. Okay, so you get the evaluations, and then What ultimately happens at school? Where's this heading? Stepping back, like maybe six months prior, I had received a grant to make a film about inclusive education. So I had started on this journey of myself learning what inclusion is. So we filmed with experts around the country learning about inclusive education. We went to the Henderson School in Boston and we saw inclusion at its best, in my opinion. It's a school where 40% of children have a disability and 20% have a significant disability and there's not a single child that's segregated. So at this time, I'm learning a lot about inclusive education and starting to really be sold on it myself. Like this is absolutely the place we want Emilio to be. And as that's happening, we're starting to notice that Emilio's kind of getting put down a path towards segregation. So that's when we started turning the cameras on ourselves and filming our IP meetings and they changed the trajectory of the film into this, what was a more cerebral film about inclusive education and became a very emotional film about trying to include our child. So we get to the first meeting and the evaluations were not good by the evaluations standards. So we went into the meeting just hoping for the best and ultimately thinking that they would listen to us because we were the experts on our son and we had spent the most time with him and he, we knew what he was capable of and what he'd need. The very first thing they start doing is showing us a bell curve and where Emilio fits on that curve. It harkens back to movies I've seen. I didn't know they still did that. And they told us that Emilio didn't even fit on the picture of the curve. And immediately I knew that this wasn't headed in the right direction and that no matter what we said, we would not come out of that meeting with the outcome that we wanted. And at that time, we had been talking to an advocate and we told her that, listen, we'll go to this meeting alone. My wife is a special education teacher. She has a master's in special education. Like certainly they'll take her professional opinion in the meeting. And very quickly it, it went south and we realized that we would have to reconvene and that we were definitely going with an advocate for the rest, <laughs> for the rest yeah. of the year schooling. Okay. So I'm going back real far, but why did you get that grant? Like, why were you interested in doing that? Is that something that's close to the work that you do? And I'll just go ahead and say to my audience, I love for you to feel like you're sitting at my kitchen table 
you now know this is a secret right now to the rest of the world, you guys, I told you, but I made a job, another job transition. And so in this chaotic week, I did not watch this documentary yet. And now I cannot wait to watch it because I'm like, oh my gosh, we get to see inside the IEP meetings and we get this like expert piece, which was actually what was intended in the beginning. So it was that, is that secondary to like something that you do professionally or were you like, I'm ready. I'm all in. Yeah. So I neglected to say that in the beginning that I'm, I'm a filmmaker. So I have a production company and we do documentary and commercial work. So cool. filmmaking has always been my tool of expression. And the opportunity came up with Alana, which is a Brazilian foundation to make a film about inclusive education. And I jumped at the chance and they gave me an opportunity. The film was in the works before we were even thinking about kindergarten or nursery preschool for Emilio. Yeah. It just, it just all happened at the same time. Okay. 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 Yeah. That totally makes sense. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> but how crazy that you have had these conversations about why inclusion works. And I got to tell you, I, when I was working at NDSC, I did all of this research on what teachers need. Teachers know that inclusion works. So there's a thousand books over this shoulder right here. That, and there's a thousand COVID tests up there. It's a bad background. <laughs> <laughs> that talks about why, why inclusion works. Every, they know that it works. They know the research. That is now a fact. But what teachers need to know is how to do it. And by the way, just as an aside, I think a lot of these discussions having done this professionally for many years, I think a lot of these discussions would go differently if we could get training in teachers' hands as to how to do it. How exactly do you modify at my grade level for all of this stuff? Science, social studies, math, language arts, all of it. How do I modify a school-wide assembly to make it accessible? How do I do this? So I feel very passionately about the fact that we need to get information now in the hands of teachers that is super duper practical and no longer theoretical. And I don't know how you feel about this with Soapbox, but it's like my recent hurrah. I I think that inclusion is a mindset. And through through the decades, the mindset of seclusion has dominated. We need to separate the gifted and talented. We need to separate students with disabilities. The children that have developmental disabilities belong in this other box. The children that have autism belong in this other box. There has to be a, a shift in the mindset of educators so that we can make inclusion work um, for everybody because it is possible. It, it's doable. The research is there. The evidence is it's there. However, we need to start inculcating that that sense of belonging for the teachers and the students not seeing teachers only as special educators or gen ed educators we are all educating the children so how are we going to make it work i think those skills that, that and those tools that teachers need moving forward on teacher training and teacher preparation programs they have to be offered and they have they have to be explicitly taught to to educators so that they can use them in the classroom and make the learning experience meaningful for everybody you know what i think you're right i think and i think a lot of teachers think that they have the mindset that they really do think inclusively, but the problem is they don't have the strategies. So what they offer is a seat in the classroom, but without good specially designed instruction and without modifying curriculum and right. actually understanding how accommodations can help a child access their curriculum. A sensory diet is not just something to put on paper and it's not offering somebody a fidget or playing with shaving cream once a week. A sensory diet is something that has to be given non-contingent on a, with some structure in order to access sensory activation or sensory stimulation or to help with sensory avoidance so that then we are conditioned for learning. We are ready to learn. But unless we layer all those supports on in just the right way, all that we're doing with an inclusive mindset is providing a seat at the table. We actually have to provide the specially designed instruction that we need in addition to better tools to access that gen ed environment. And that's the whole key. 
Absolutely. We filmed with, we, we filmed two segments actually that didn't make the film because we changed the film into this more, more about our journey, but we right. filmed with David Rose, who was one of the creators of universal design for learning. And he had a really good example. He's what we need to create in the classroom is a ramp for learners. And just like a wheelchair ramp is useful for people in a wheelchair. That ramp for learning is really useful for all types of learners. And he said that we, we need to stop trying to teach classes to this mythical average that doesn't exist. We need to start teaching towards the margins and that way everybody can be included in the classroom. But I think there's a lot out there on how to do this now. And it, for example, the Henderson School will invite anybody that asks to come observe their school. We also filmed with another organization that I thought was really interesting called SWIFT. And SWIFT, they go into schools and they use the resources. At the University that, of Kansas, we should say, just so that they get Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were really generous with their time and explained their process. And they, they go into schools using the resources they already have within the school and over a period of years, transform the school into an inclusive school. And they don't do it overnight because they don't want to shock the system, but they, they teach teachers on different methods and different strategies to become successfully inclusive. Because as you said, I went to some schools where they said they were practicing inclusion and it was literally just the fact that the child was in the class. I would argue that's worse in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you anymore. The Swift Center, by the way, just got the grant that the Thai Center in Minnesota used to get. So the Swift Center is getting more federal money now, which is exciting for them. So more things to come, I hope, from them as well. Mm -hmm. Thai Center certainly did a great job with that federal grant. Okay. So ultimately what happened was you all could not agree on placement for placement for preschool, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, the, it what was. What did they recommend? Cool. Where did they want him to go? So they recommended a twelve one two to begin with, gated setting, and they basically told us that if we could find a school that would consider having him in an integrated setting, that they could probably change the recommendation. Which it, you know, and we, so we kill ourselves visiting schools and just just looking, and they were like, "Do you have the IEP?" I'm like, "No, I don't have an IEP yet." We right. couldn't even <laughs> we couldn't even visit inclusive preschool programs because we didn't have the proper. Of course, IEP. Yeah. yeah. I uh, did the same thing. I went and observed twenty preschools. Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> where now, hilariously enough, I had a client that was getting divorced with a preschooler, and they were arguing about where to put this typical preschooler. And so I could bill for some of it. <laughs> <laughs> and useful. I told him, I was like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about my kid too. And he was like, that's fine. I'm going to pay you 20 minutes for 20 minutes at, I don't know, five or eight different preschools. So I'm like, okay, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice when work blends with yeah. life, right? <laughs> sure. It just happened for you. It happens for me. It's good for the goose and for the gander, as they say. <laughs> so you went and observed all these schools and you went on the wild goose chase and found out. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, he, we found a place that was willing to get him in, but it was like a conditional situation where they said, we'll, we'll let him be in this class for this amount of time and if he can handle it then he can't will change the recommendation so it just it was just something that was just bound to push him out of that environment which yep. was not okay with us at any point point. and so the movie basically depicts how our journey to to get out of that situation went by and uh, I'll say that for anyone watching the film, the last scene, I think will shock a lot of people it was it was an accidental moment, but it happened and we had it on camera. And I think it's potentially the first time that you see segregation happening live and how it happens in such a big system. Wow. It's so I definitely recommend trying to make it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> what has been the response to the The response has been really great. I get a lot of response from families feeling empowered because one thing, you know, that I learned through the process so far, and we're still so early in it still really, but is that you have to trust your gut. And I think the film helps other families see that, that ultimately, you know, you know, what's right. So don't let yourself be convinced otherwise. So that 
And then it's also, there's a lot of teachers and future teachers that are watching the film and sharing their thoughts with me. And a lot of teachers appreciating it, knowing what it's like to be at the other side of the table. And then we've even had some success, the special education department, the administrators department in Staten Island watched the film and shared a lot of comments and it's changed a lot of minds on how these meetings are conducted. We're pretty early. We released the film in November and this isn't like a blockbuster film, so it rolls out over time. But as people are watching it, I'm getting a lot of reactions and a lot of people just thanking us for doing it. And I'm, I tell them like, I don't really feel like I had a choice. I had a filmmaking career, skills with cameras. How could I not tell this story and try to try to put a dent in the world and make things a little better for Emilio and everyone like him? So great. So, and that's what it's all about. We, that is the number one tip to advocacy is use what you have in your power to tell your story. That's so wonderful. So ultimately, do you all have any kind of like tried and true things that you have learned? Any tips that you could give parents out there to say, this is how we have found to successfully advocate for our son, knowing that there's no playbook, but what things work for you? So I always tell parents to set their priorities. So once you set your priorities as a family and you know what you want for your child, you can find different ways to get to where you want to get. It's never a straight, a straightforward path. You find to get them included. You find ways to get the services that you believe your child needs. So setting the priorities for the family, it's very important. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think one of the best lessons I've learned really came from Sarah Jo, Emilio's advocate, who said this has to be a collaborative process and you have to know where your line in the sand is. So for us, that line in the sand is placement. How we achieve success in an inclusive classroom, I'm open to discussing and collaborating, but ultimately you're not going to get anywhere if you're just trying to prove each other wrong or it is. But it has to be collaborative and you have to work with the other side, no matter how much you disagree. And then the other thing is that it's it's a really emotional process. I'm a pretty cool, cool-headed, collected person most of the time. <laughs> I am human, but I think that in those meetings, you feel like your child's future is being determined and it's really hard to stay calm. So it's really helpful to go with someone else that can guide you through that process. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, that's a huge piece of it, even as, an attorney myself that works almost exclusively in this area. I've used an advocate. I would do it again. I, for one meeting, I had nine. This was not my school district doing. This was my school district's attorney that was trying to bully me because I'm a lawyer, even though I was there for my kid. And I had nine attorneys on hold, ready to get the link to them. So that they could, I think I maybe even gave them all the link so that I could be like, actually, my attorney is here. Can you just approve them <laughs> and be like, hey, guys, come yes. in? Because you just never know when your emotions are going to get the best of you and you're no longer going to be objective and rational. And I think that's a huge piece to it. Where can people find the film? So the film's available on Amazon Prime. It's Forget Me Not Inclusion in the Classroom is the full title. There's a couple of films called Forget Me Nots. <laughs> so the inclusion in the classroom part is, is key to finding it easily. It's also on Vimeo. It's on Tubi where you can see it for free with advertisement. The best place to go really is our website. It's forgetmenotdocumentary.com. For short, it's fmndoc.com. And there you'll see all our social media links. You can buy a DVD if you'd like. And there's also for educational, there's DVDs as well for schools and universities. And then there's also just a bunch of free resources on the site for families and parents that, that want to browse through and things that have helped us through the process and things from people we met. Th Thomas Hare who's no longer with us. There's links to his books there, which I find extremely valuable. So I'd recommend checking out the website. Yeah, so the press kit has these wonderful list of statistics and studies and so oh, much research. I can't wait to read through that also. I'm not kidding you. I am so excited to watch it. This is what the Barlows are doing tonight on a Friday night. So. <laughs> Great. Well, you have to let us know what you think. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah, you're going to get a big, long email from me. It's so <laughs> nice to meet you all. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having Thanks us. us.
My pleasure.